Let there be peace and love among all beings of the universe. Let there be peace. Let there be peace. Let there be peace. Om Shanti Hi. Shanti Hi. Shanti Hi. Namaskar. Welcome to Satsang. If you're not proud. Pundaji, you had a, a spontaneous experience of, of divine bliss uh, at the age of eight. Could you kindly describe it and uh, what did it uh, what did it occur to you in such a young age? <coughs> First of all, I introduce these friends have come from Finland and they are having this interview for this Finnish television series entitled Mystics of the World. Mm. So they have some questions which I will try to reply, all of them, but uh, it will take a day more. <laughs> so, yeah, because, yeah, because they are <clears throat> now, Punjaji, you had a spontaneous experience of divine bliss at the age of eight. Could you kindly describe it? Mm. Why did it occur to you at such a young age? And this is a long story. When I was living in Lailpur, a name of a town now in Pakistan, and we had school holidays during summer, and my mother told me, I will take you to Lahore and show you Shalimar Garden and Museum and other places of uh, interest during this Mughal period. And a very big zoological garden is also there. So we went there. And she stayed with her sister who was living in Lahore, now Pakistan. So first day in the evening, generally in Punjab in summer, they make almond mixture, almond plus milk and some ice in it. So all the members of the family of my mother's sister and we were together in a circle and they were passing on the cups of this milkshake to everybody. And when my turn came, I didn't take, not because intentionally I didn't take, I could not take because I was in some state which I have not felt before. So they tried again and again, and they wanted to put this milkshake in my mouth. I didn't respond. And what they thought was that I am haunted by some ghost. 
So this they used to attribute there in those days and then if someone is like this, they will take him near a mosque, Muslim mosque and the Maulvi or the priest of the mosque will take a pair of tongs and move it on the body and then they said he will be all right. And any buffalo or cow also becomes sick and does not give milk, that also they take to the mosque and the Maulvi moves a tongue and then lift the tail of the <laughs> and then it gives milk, yes, more milk than before. So what did they take in tongues? I do not know because I was too young in those days. <laughs> but then they say, the Maulvi said, you take him away, he'll be all right. So again they lifted me in the lap and then brought me to their place and I again sat down like this thing, not aware of what is going on. So I kept up like this state for another 24 hours. Then I opened my eyes and then my mother said, why you were not accepting and why you were like this? Did you see Krishna? I said, no, I've not seen anyone. Then why you were crying? The tears were dropping like rain from my eyes. And why you were crying? I said, I do not know if I am crying. Then what do you feel? I told my mother, I do not know what it is, but I was very, very happy that I had not been before. Due to this happiness, tears were falling. So my mother was very much afraid and then she didn't take me anywhere else. All the time she was staying with me and also making me sleep with her. So after a few days, we returned. I again started going to school, but always thinking something, what it could be which gives me a lot of happiness and bliss. So this thing was revolving even in the school and when I came back, so we had a garden where my father was working in the railways. He had a big bungalow and a garden. So I will go and sit behind the orange bush, having a book in hand, because my father will say after that, you must have got some homework you have to finish. So I will go there having a book in hand, but my mind was somewhere else which I cannot describe and something was pulling me from all activities of the world. So that continued always, you see. So the school period also was finished and then this is uh, the answer of the question which we asked, how did it arrive? I do not know how. It just happened without any of my effort because there was nobody in the family from whom I had heard and have never read because in Pakistan we didn't have any Hindi literature, nor do I know. I know only Persian and Urdu and have a much knowledge of the poets of Iran and some other poets of India some hundred or two hundred years ago. So this is what I felt. So now next question. (laughs) 
what was the effect of this experience in your life? The effect of this experience was, I don't first of all call it experience, because experience wants experiencer, experienced, and experience. But this was not that. Something, something was pulling me inside. And what was the inside and what was that thing which pulled me and it has no form, no personification of any person. Just a pull within and that within I do not know what it was. The effect of this experience was that I was always happy since then till date. Happy inside, you see. Why, what part, I do not know. <laughs> Why did you become an ardent devotee of Lord Krishna of such a deep experience of the Self? First of all, I do not call it an experience of the Self and I did not know what the Self was. And devotee of Lord Krishna means because Krishna was a devotee. My mother was a devotee of Krishna and Krishna was God not only for her but everybody in India. They worship Lord Krishna as God of all, God had of all other gods, you see. Therefore, as a tra tradition, I listened to my mother and also started loving Krishna because such a beautiful person which I have seen with my eyes. So it happened in Punjab when we returned to Lailpur, now Faisalabad. And when I slept for the first night, I saw Krishna playing with me. And I covered my blanket over me, even then I saw him. Then I told him, you go to my mother because she loves to see you and not me. And I was fighting with him, my mother overheard and she woke up and she said, what are you, to whom you are sleeping and what are you doing? I said, your Krishna is troubling me, he does not allow me to sleep. And then she came to my bed and asked, where is Krishna, here it is, don't you see him? She said, no, I don't see. So I said, you, to Krishna, you go to my mother and allow me to sleep because tomorrow I have got to go to school and don't come <laughs> there. <laughs> so like these things, it were happening. So therefore, I don't call that I was a devotee of Krishna. He was my friend, became my friend. I loved him and he loved me. So God need not want any devotees. He wants someone who love him and God wants to love anyone who loves him because God is love himself. Do the Hindu, Hindu gods and goddesses really exist? <laughs> so, Hindu gods are Christian gods, they all exist because the gods live in your faith. When you have faith in some, someone, that someone loves you and that someone could be called as God because 
he is so attractive that you want to love him not only in india when i was traveling in the west i went to spain and you might have heard in spain there is a town called avilon avilon and there one woman used to love jesus christ like our meera loved krishna you see and she wanted to ha- kiss kiss lord jesus so one day i have gone to that place and i have seen a small house where she lived and a very small mud house and her embroidery still there which she used to stitch and also the clothes for jesus and a small idol of jesus was there you see and one day jesus came and kissed her and hugged her and she was so happy she wanted to convey this news to her uh, guru or teacher who was uh, saint john of the book not saint john of the cross in the bible and it was 16th century the church was there and now it is renovated but he lived about 20 miles so she went 20 miles and told him the story today my desire is fulfilled and he asked what desire i loved christ and always it was it was in my mind that i want to kiss jesus and hug him and so it happened and he was very happy and smiling and looking i i love him he said no it cannot happen it may be a demon because jesus never laughs <laughs> so he only cries he cried at the cross also it may be a demon so i was not happy about this statement <laughs> made so that is the difference between the gods in india and gods abroad what about the deities of uh, other religions do they also exist can one find the final truth through any religion yes it is perfect that all the gods of different countries they exist and one can find final truth through any religion but he must be ardent very true honest to love god and not simply going to temples or church stay there and pray that is not enough you see as you see in the churches most of people who go visit the churches sit on the benches and they keep their head on this bench and sleep <laughs> and most of them are between 80 and 90 <laughs> so they can't go to any society nobody likes in the house the son doesn't like them the daughter in law also do not like the old men so they spend all the time in the church you see so not like that you see if you go to the church then you see you must seek 
Jesus Christ himself and don't return empty-handed without seeing him. So I believe everybody can see every religion, every country. Since you practice Krishna meditation for 25 years by repeating his name and visualizing his form, it looks like mantra meditation is capable of purifying the disciple's mind. Is this true? It is absolutely true that repetition of the mantra will reach you so that you can see God in front of you. Because when you are repeating and the name that you are repeating, that person is somewhere which everybody cannot see. So where he is, he is within your own heart. He is listening that you are calling him. As someone is going ahead of you and you call and he will look behind because it is his name. So when you say Jesus or Rama or Krishna, he is not seen anywhere else, it is inside you. So he listens and he responds to you. And and it purifies the disciple's mind and you say, is it true? Yes, because when you are repeating his name, God's name, which purifies at that time what happened. Otherwise, supposing you are chanting the name for one hour, it engages you for one hour, that one hour you have no other person in your mind, nor you think of any other one. So that one hour you are saved from seeing anybody else who does not give you happiness, but only suffering. So one hour you are spent for God at least to see. So that one hour is to your credit. So if you go on chanting the name, then you like it because now you are free of attachments of other people. Therefore, you will go on increasing this time, hour to two hours, three hours, four hours. So all the time you cannot get out of this chanting. So all the 24 hours you are chanting. So all the 24 hours you are chanting and your mind is not attached to any other person, only to one whose name you are chanting, and that manifests itself in front of you. And you can see in vision who, whose name is being chanted, you see. Your father forced you to marry but you have said that actually your marriage took place because you had an unfulfilled desire of, of your wife in your earlier incarnation when you were a great Krishna devotee. Yeah. So this happened when I was working in the mining corporation in Karnataka. So I had, I was very near to that place which, where I was working and this place where I was in my last incarnation also a devotee of Krishna. So I tell you that I had an ashram around 85 years by my age in previous incarnation and I lived in an ashram of my own and I had about 200 disciples also. 
So I used to meditate and chant the name of Krishna and I will stay without any other activity for say 10 hours, 12 hours a day and then I will get up and attend to my other activities. People will come and I will speak to them and then we will have lunch, all these things. One day it so happened that I didn't wake up for 24 hours. And during that period, some disciples, they were beating on my head. I did not respond. Then one br man brought, brought one a knife with which they peel coconuts, just, just like this thing. So he pierced this place here, opened it, and even then I did not wake up. But I knew what is happening. I, I could not speak, but what they are doing I knew. And they said, the Guruji has attained Mahasamadhi, so he has to be buried. So this was announced in the town. And many people came, they dug a big pit and collected coconuts, that's how they do. They don't uh, cremate, they don't burn the body of a yogi or a saint. So they were burning, so I was thinking, that they will bury me alive. So, but I, I cannot move as, as dead but conscious. And regarding the other part of your question about the wife, there was one woman belonging to low caste. Also, they were, her father was bringing the coconuts down many coconut trees in the ashram. So in those days, for 100 coconuts that one drops, he will get five coconuts for the labor. So this is all what they were doing. He had a very beautiful daughter. Not beautiful, young you can say. <laughs> young. Very young, very healthy. And as a guru, I could not <laughs> touch her, you see. Because she belonged to low caste. Here they call Shudra, you see. Brahman, Kshatri, Vaish, and Shudra, I mean the low caste. You don't touch them, you don't speak to them, you don't eat with them, you don't allow them to enter in your house. But some, I had some lustful eye with her. <laughs> So as a guru, as a guru I could not do it. But in my mind, my mind was as engrossed with her and let alone there was no mantra in my mind. The mantra. <laughs> as, as, as you are a young man, you must have had this kind of experience in Finland. <laughs> I, I also try to repeat the mantra. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> so mantra, I will tell you how the mantra is affected. It's written in this Manas Ramayana. And if you repeat mantra for 96 crores, then directly Lord Ram is in front of you. So that is the effect of chanting the mantra. But when love is somewhere else, and you may be repeating by mouth, but mind is somewhere else, you see. And that was my intention, but it had to be Fructified. If this uh, desire is not fulfilled, it has to be fulfilled and you will take incarnation 
to have it fulfilled. Now, in this life, the same woman whom I did not touch became my wife. And she had now to become a Brahmin so that I marry her. <laughs> and I did not tell her not to anybody else, not even to my son, but inside I was thinking, you see, I thought of her and this incarnation I have only taken for her and what to do now and you take care for next life, it should not happen. So now I was keeping myself away and every guru keeps away from the woman, you see. But inside, what is he, nobody knows except him. <laughs> and now this is the result. I was keeping aloof from the woman, and now you see what is my luck here now. <laughs> So enough is enough. <laughs> you joined the freedom fighters and believed in violence and effective method to throw the British out of India. How was it possible for ardent Krishna devotee do you still believe in violent solutions to political and social problems, you see? As a devotee of Krishna, because he says, Krishna is a good fighter himself, you see, has this Sudarshan Chakra on him. So his own uncle was troubling the whole state and like this he stood against him and his student Arjun, he also was not fighting in the Mahabharata and the trouble was that the cousins wanted to distribute this Delhi, it was Hastinapur, half-half and they did not give him anything. Now they wanted to run away. This people doesn't matter. We can't fight. But Krishna compels them to fly, fight. He says, you have to fight for your right. And these are not good people. They are usurping the land of others. Therefore, you have to fight and you have to win and you will become the monarch of this place. And they are not good men, therefore you have to kill them. And Arjun does not accept it. He says, they are my cousin brothers. If I kill them, I will go to hell. And this man also stood in front of me, is my guru, my own guru, from whom I have learned archery. He taught me this, how can I kill him? And Krishna says, they are standing in front of you and they are joining the people who are not just. Therefore, you kill even your guru if he is not just, you see. So Krishna asks him to fight and he does not fight, you see. Again and again he tells him, so it is, the Gita has 18 chapters, you see. So out of 18 chapters, he, in each chapter he asks him. So lastly, he says, you give up all your duties and dharmas, you surrender to me, I will take care of you. You surrender your mind to me, I will look after you, I will give you salvation. And if you win, you have this land also, and also the moksham, salvation, that I guarantee. You worry not. 
So now he takes up the bow and arrow and he kills everybody. So fighting and killing also did not send him to hell because he fought for the good of the people and peaceful country. For that you can fight, you see. And Krishna also <coughs> fought for this and Rama also fought for this. You see. So there is no trouble if you fight, but if you kill innocent people, of course, that is a sin, you see. Uh, then I believe that the motivation must be pure, not selfish motivation. Not selfish, but for the good of others. That's what I'm speaking. Not selfish. If you do for selfish, then you go to hell. Not that, you see. But peaceful living, so that all the beings in the world are living in peace. For that, you have to fight if you had to. Gradually, you, your religion aspiration to see God made it impossible for you to continue your army career. What happened? I was in the army and even in the army, I used to get up at two o'clock and I used to meditate and I did not sleep on this bed which was provided to me. On the ground I will lie down and I will get up and I would ask my orderly that he should not come inside before five. Only at five you give me a cup of coffee and you are not supposed to come inside. So inside what I used to do was in the night I would dress up a woman's dress, sari, blouse and some nice makeup on my face <laughs> because I saw some photos of Krishna and all the girls around him they were very beautiful and don't we have some uh, there, some Radha Krishna you must have seen or I will show you when you come next to to my house, okay? So I thought Krishna is fond of girls and perhaps if I am girl he will come and sleep with me. <laughs> and then I used to make up myself, apply lipstick and then everything you see. <laughs> and then also he did not come. <laughs> so this is not the way. So I went to where I was working, Army Academy was in Dehradun, some 20 miles away from Dehradun. So uh, you have brought this? Ah, you can see this. Yes. This is from <coughs> from the museum, some museum. Yes. So like this I will dress up. <laughs> so I once I went to Rishikesh because I heard there is one big ashram and Swami Shivananda in those days was alive. And I was still in army dress, you see. So I gone there and asked him, have you seen God? This question nobody will like, you see. <laughs> if you ask this question to any saint, he will think that you are some some loose in your system. <laughs> and his devotees woke up, stood up, and they, sh they are showing me gray beards. 
grey beard. She says, our beards are gone grey here, we are standing, staying 30, 40 years and you are just standing, not even saluting the Guru and you say, have you seen God? If you have, can you show? This was my question, you see. Everybody was angry and they threw me out of the ashram. <laughs> And this question remained with me, wherever I went I will ask him and nobody will say yes. What I used to tell them was, supposing I go to super bazaar, I want something and that's something they have. If they have, I want it, I will pay money and then they will give me the thing there's no problem and they will not say you have to meditate first and then I give you. Anybody can pay money and give but when I say if you have this commodity or if you have can you give me and what price? So this question was, was not a question that should be asked but they said and I kept it with me. Then I traveled. I, then at that point I, I resigned my job, you see. And going from place to place, south, north, and nobody said, you can't do, you have to make some penance for years. <coughs> then only you can see God, and not, not always. So all the money which I had and earned from the army I have spent. Finally, I go back to my house again and I was very much disgusted. In whole country, nobody says, I have seen God. So I was sitting one day, a beggar comes to my house and I asked him, would you like to eat food with me? then come in. He came inside and had food with me. Then I asked Swamiji, have you seen any God, any person who has seen God in India? He said, yes. Then I said, give me his address. So he gave one address of Tiruvannamalai. You go to Tiruvannamalai and there is a man who has seen God and he will enable you to see God yourself. So what happened? Address I noted down, but it was far in the south and I didn't have money. So I was thinking my father will not give money, he is also now retired a small pension he gets to run the family. So I didn't ask. If I asked, he would not give. Now I went to the town to ask some money from my friends. <coughs> so I had one friend who was a sweet meat uh, dealer and used to sell milk and yogurt and also used to wrestle with me. So when I went <laughs> there, there was a paper, Tribune, which was the paper, newspaper of uh, Punjab. Tribune, I s took up the paper and find the column of vacancies. So in that paper it was written, wanted an ex-army officer to work in our CBID, in our canteen in Madras. So you have to apply for this thing. And that contractor who was wanting this was living in Peshawar. And his name was Khan Bahadur Abdur Rashid Khan. Army contractors to Cheshire Regiment of uh, England. So the, this regiment moved to Awadi near Madras. And so they sent me 500 rupees, you join in a month. 
So taking this money, I went to Madras. Then I said, one month is given, so I will proceed to Tiruvannamalai first. So I went to Tiruvannamalai and in a bullock cart from the station, I go there and unloaded my luggage which I took from home. And somebody pointed me, you go in the hall and Maharishi is sitting there. You go, go soon because after that there will be lunch time. And then for three hours after lunch, 11.30 to 3, three o'clock, you cannot see him. So I, so I saw the same man who gave me address in in Lailpur. So I didn't enter. I said, he is a fraud, you see. So I, I didn't want to see him. And then I wanted the other tanga or a bullock cart to go to the station and go back. So when I was going, there was one Parsi gentleman, Pramji, his name, and the proprietor of Billington Cinemas in this country. He said, isn't it uh, that you are from North India? I said, yes. Isn't it that you came just now? Yes, I said. Why do you go so soon? Why don't you stay for, for a day or two and stay with me? I said, no, he is a fraud. I don't want to stay with him because he said how he was, he was astonished. And he said, he has never gone anywhere. Fifty years now, he came from Madurai and stayed on here. So it may be some other man. I said, no, it was the same man. Then he said, you stay. I take you to, a, to the president. So I went there and I met Chinna Swami, Nrinananda Swami was there and he gave me a place to stay. He said, you stay here, very nice man he was. You stay here and stay as long as you want. So then the bell rang for the lunch. He said, now you first go and take lunch, keep your things here. So I go to, to the dining hall and I sat just in front of Maharishi. And there was a curtain, Brahmins and non-Brahmins, you see. Because Brahmins will not eat with non-Brahmins. So some 20, 25 Brahmins will stay on the other side and Maharishi was in the center. So I sat there and they served rice and sambar and some one vegetable. And I was eating, but looking at him, still could not recognize that he is the same man. I was looking at him and then he was looking at me. I was eating, looking at him. Now, how he is eating, I was, I was marking, he cleaned the whole leaf, didn't leave anything on the not a rain, grain of rice on it, very nicely licked with the whole hand. <laughs> now, he goes to hall for rest, and I didn't know that I am not allowed. So, I didn't know the rule also, so I went there and one Krishna Swami, he was his name, caretaker of the hall, he said, no, in Tamil he said, you see, no, you come at three o'clock, understand, like this thing. Mm -hmm. So then Maharishi saw me and then he said like this thing, nobody in the hall, I alone was there. I asked him a question. Was it you who visited my place in Punjab and is it you that gave me the address? He did not speak. 
again and again I ask him the question. I even ask him, have you seen God? Could you show me God? Again, silent. So I was not happy with this man. <laughs> again left. Then place was good. Mountain was nice, you see. All the surrounding was very good. Then I said, since I have come here, I have now 25 days more, so I can safely spend 10 days here. So I went on the other side of the mountain, Adi Anamalai, and there I was staying and going around the mountain also alone. So some attraction was with the mountain. Now, after ten days, I decided to return to Madras. But why not see him? So, I went to see him again. And I told him, I am going to Madras. And then he said, okay, you can go. And so I went there and joined my duty and they had given me a place to stay. And then the night I saw him again. Marishi, I see him again. Again I ask him, this is the same person who came to me in Punjab. So like this some attraction cropped up, you see. So did I understand right that did you see him in, in the vision? That I can't decide. I see. Because most people to whom I tell this story, they all ask, this was a vision or a dream. So I do not know if it was a dream or a vision or even a reality. This was something which was not even real. Because you are real, everybody is real, not that reality, something beyond it, you see. So some attraction was there. So Saturday used to be holiday, Sunday, Saturday. I used to go every Saturday and Sunday again. So sit with Maharishi and all that, see, getting more and more attached with him. Like this, two years have been passed. And there was one man who writes books on Maharishi, day by day with Bhagwan, Devraj, his name, he asked me, I was not reading any newspapers. <coughs> he asked me, where does your family stay? I said, in Punjab. He says, do you know the Punjab country is being partitioned and from river Ravi, on the other side is Pakistan, this side is India. So which side your parents or family staying? I said, on the other side. It goes to Pakistan. Then he says, you better go back and bring everybody to here or shift to India. Again, some trouble will be there and your fathers and parents will be and relations will be murdered. So I said, no, now I have no parents, no family. I am attached with this man, with Maharishi. And uh, this happened before your realization? Before? Did this happen before or after your realization? After? Uh, you, uh, this did happen before your realization, self-realization. I do not know before or after. Of realization is no before and no after because it doesn't depend on time. And still I do not know if I am realized. <laughs> <laughs> so in the morning walk, he spoke to Maharishi. I asked him to go back to Punjab, he says, he has no parents, it was all dream. So Maharishi says, why don't you go and look after your parents? I said, 
I had parents before meeting you and now after having seen you, I am attached to you. It was a dream which is no more there now. Maharishi told me, if it is a dream, then all your activities are in the dream. You are going there and saving your parents are also is a dream. So you go. So now I could not argue with him. So I picked up some dust from his feet and he blessed me and he said, I am with you wherever you are. So I go to Lahore, train is empty, nobody is going. And I asked a man who is selling tea, tea stall man, this train is all empty, is it not going? The time is for this train which goes from Lahore to Lailpur. He said, no, because of the partition, Nobody goes, nobody travels, except Muslims who are shouting there, we will kill the Hindus. And some people who are sitting next to the brick one near the guard, railway guard, thinking that it is a secure place for us. They may be going next station or that, and they will be killed. So he didn't know I am a Hindu or a Muslim. So I was thinking what to do now. He has told me that these people will be killed. Other people, they are shouting, kill the Kafirs, kill the atheists, kill the Hindus. And then I said, if I sit with them, I have Om on my hand. If they will see, they will kill me, you see. But then I said, they, they are in a lot of tension. They have no time to look at my hand, but I will do like this thing, doesn't matter. So I sat with the Muslims, you see. So the train starts. After about five miles, they pull the chain, train stop, and they asked everyone to come out and they kill them. So I reach my place in the night. Then the Tanga driver was a Muslim. So I told him if uh, I ask him that I go to my locality, which is absolutely Hindu locality, Guru Nanak Pura is the name, and this man will take me to Islam Pura, another colony. So I told him, you take me to Muslim colony, and stop here, my house is here. I paid him, he went back. So I went on foot one mile in the night. I rang the bell, no response. And again gave a long bell and my father goes on the top of the house on, and asks, who is it? Who are you? Then I said, can't you know your son. He said, why you have come? It is burning. This place is burning and we cannot escape. Already Muslims from other side of Punjab, East Punjab have come and have occupied our place. So he said, we heard that trains are not working. The trains are there. He said, you take away your wife, children and other relations, they have all got collected here and you take them away. If the trains, again the trains will not be there and we stay on here. Many times their invaders have come to India, but then we have not left our home. We will stay here. Then I told him the DM, district magistrate of this city, has been working with me in the army. So I will go and speak to him to give you some security. So I went there and asked him, I am going away. He said, no, there's no problem. You can come and stay with me. And then he said, 
your parents can come with me or I can post to security people there, they can stay there. Then he himself drove me there and we had been good friends in the army also, you see. And then he said, you come and shift to my place and all the house except one room was occupied. Three houses we have got in the line, all were occupied by the Muslims. And then he took them to his place. Then my parents wanted to go away to India also. Everybody, there was no Hindu, all Hindus were butchered, you see. And the young women also, they jumped into the village, in the wells and killed themselves. And then he sent them, my parents, in a, in a plane, charged plane, army plane, and they asked them to leave them in Delhi. So I gave them, I have a friend working in the Air Army in Lucknow. So this address was with them, so they came there. And after six, from that day we are living in Lucknow. What made you what made you to want to find a guru and how did you try to find it? We are we have actually you have been answering quite many questions That's already here. And finally the Guru Ramana Marishi found you this I also told yes, you yes. found you here. What took place when you met Ramana Maharishi for the first time? <laughs> you needed physical guru. Does that mean that everybody needs a physical guru in order to realize the truth, in order to find divine love? This <coughs> if you if you are physical man, you need a physical guru. If you find that you are in a body, you need a guru in the body, otherwise guru is within you. But you don't understand his language. Therefore, guru with body is necessary for the student who is in the body so that they converse with each other and remove the doubts of the student so that he knows the guru is within. You need a guru without just to tell you I am within you. For that purpose you can need a guru with the body. Otherwise, Guru without body, formless, is within you. And you too are formless, you see. If you feel, then you don't need a Guru in physical body. Why are some people like Ramana Maharishi able to find the truth without physical Guru? Ramana Maharishi also had a physical guru. Don't you know? But his body, his physique was very big. <laughs> <laughs> it was Arunachala itself. One professor from Glasgow University, he asked him the same question in this context. He asked him, you say the Guru is needed always, but you don't have Guru. Then he replied, <coughs> pointing at Arunachala, he is my Guru. So Guru could be any form, you see. And you can also 
she if she go to mountain he is silent to say does not move so that is the symptom of a good guru he does not teach by word by words the truth cannot be conveyed so silence is the teaching which marishi also taught in silence to say like mountain so that has spread like wildfire his teaching then other teachers who bark day and night and nobody <laughs> goes near them you see. so so if you are quiet silent peace and you have shanti in you so this silence is your own guru and that cannot be found anywhere else except within so that is how we begin with peace quiet and shanti in the day time before satsang is and then of course you have to remove the doubts from the students minds you can speak still this talk is not a talk if you have doubt you come to a guru you must speak ask him and remove your doubt <coughs> when no doubt you are in peace you see. Why didn't you take seriously Maharishi's advice to find out who you really are? What does it mean? Not yet getting. Uh, I understood that when you came first time to Ramana Maharshi and asked the question, "Can you show me God?" and Maharishi answered that you have to find out who you are. But still, you continue doing Krishna meditation for quite long time. So that means that you didn't take seriously what he was saying. So I took very seriously what he spoke, and also he did not say that you don't uh, don't have love with Krishna. So there is no difference between Krishna and Maharishi. so everybody thought that devotion is something else than knowledge so on one occasion i was there myself some devotees from vrindavan krishna bhaktas from vrindavan they were going to madure to see meenakshi temple so on the way they stopped they had heard that there is maharishi and they also took one picture of krishna from vrindavan to be offered to maharishi so i was staying there so i was looking maharishi is looking the picture and asked someone to keep it and didn't speak to them but i saw maharishi melted in devotion also dropping tears from his eyes so then i thought there cannot be better bhakta better devotee than maharishi so this is the symptom you see of devotion there are three four symptoms of a devotee of any god or rama or krishna number 1 tears will drop from the eyes because you can see when you meet a very deep friend you drop some tears number 2 you have choked voice choked voice you cannot speak as other people speak 
here something is choking. So choking and tears and then you have a sort of when you are thunderstruck, you see, wonderstruck, and you have some kind of absolute stillness in the mind, seeing something new for the first time, the mind becomes still, even heart stops. You see. So that stillness means uh, what could be English word at that? Wonderstruck? Wonderstruck, you see. But in Hindi we have got a beautiful word, you see, like this thing. And you do not know, you do not even breathe. And fourth one, haripilation. Haripilation, you understand? No, because Finnish people. <laughs> the hair of the body stand erect on foot. This is called haripilation. So many people who come here, I can testify with this symptom. But your hair are also standing, isn't it now? Some kind of hair are standing. When I was reading uh, Punjaji's story from uh, David Godman has written it, I was uh, weeping. It was uh, so touching. I see. Yeah. So these are the symptoms, outer symptoms, they say. Mm. What made you to continue your meditation on Lord Krishna? And does this mean that this sort of meditation is beneficial? An important step while climbing two stairs to enlightenment. So meditation is always beneficial, even after enlightenment. What else you can do? Because meditation means you don't have to attach to anything which is not everlasting. This keeps you at home. You sit and meditate always as much as you could. And why to run about when you have found peace of mind? And there can be peace of mind only when you meditate, not waste your time with the talk on the road. Just now you can find the difference, people who are here, they look different, their face is different than nine inches on the other side of the wall, what is happening. So it is better to have meditation always. <coughs> there is, as long as there is a time for departure and then even the departure will be beautiful when you are meditating. You can see how my departure was beautiful <laughs> while meditating and not to get rid of it. And if there is any desire, that also the meditation will fulfill. Doesn't matter, you have another incarnation because you know the world's age is 96 million years, you see. And to become a man, you have spent that much time. So in that span, one or two incarnations, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> now you are coming from Finland. There must be something that this profession is taking you to see the saints of the country, you see. So this is also your good luck and some unfulfilled desire has given you this profession. So this is the reason, that's why when you came 
I looked at you and profession is only a cause simply to make you travel but inside someone is there directing you go here and there and finally you will know who you are. <laughs> After intense Krishna meditation, gods and goddesses visit you. Why? Gods and goddesses, as we have, we are living in this in this plane. We are men, humans. Some higher plane, there are better, superior people than our people also. And down below, another level, people are subhuman, other cannibals even, you see. So like this we go on going, we do not know. Some people are very superior and I have seen myself visited different planes some planes the people are very handsome that you can see their bodies through and through and very lovely some planes i have already visited and some planes are very very beautiful and sub down i have seen i got afraid to see people with half faces you see one eye <laughs> half nose, half body, and I got very afraid. <laughs> so like this we do not know from the beginning this they are coming, but they will be evolving. Now next time we will become gods if we do not, do not have moksha or liberation, we will go on going and finally again drop here. This is the place which you can win freedom and no better, even gods have to be born here. So this thing what you ask is, they have been visiting me because a man who is enlightened is superior to God because God can live young for thousands of years and fulfill their desires in the heavens, again fall down here, you see. Why were you so unable, why were you now unable to continue your Krishna meditation after such a divine experience? <coughs> and now, if you think that I am not continuing the Krishna meditation is only because now I find, I feel I am Him. For that reason, I need not be His devotee, nor He be my Lord. We are same. This is the essence you have to understand, you see. I may here quote you one story of a chancellor, vice chancellor of University of Madrid. <coughs> when I was traveling in Spain, I was staying with the architect of General Franco who built his palace. He came to visit me in Barcelona, so I had gone there, and he came to know that some Indian yogi is staying with Enrique, who is architect. So he phoned him, can we come to see him? He said, I will ask him. So he came to me and 
and asked me if uh, he wants to see you, can you accept? But I advise you, you don't accept, he is anti-Indian. He speaks ill of Indian saints and sages. I'll come, to, go to bathroom and come. Huh?